Okay, so good news. I graded all the exams. Don't ask me how long it took. And don't ask me how productive I was at work yesterday. Um, but they're all graded and I'll release them at the end of today after I'm done lecturing. I'm not gonna do it beforehand or else all I'm gonna have is like a thousand pings on my phone for regrade requests during lecture. And you guys aren't gonna pay attention. So I'll, I'll do that afterwards. Hopefully we'll finish a little bit early. So you will have a little bit of time to ask any immediate questions about it. Here are the statistics. Um, so we got a pretty good distribution. Um, So uh, another thing, project two, I'm gonna give an extension until Sunday, um, mainly cause like nobody submitted yet. And I kind of want you guys to have some time to you know think about and actually implement a, a, a good custom um, prefetcher. So I wanna give you a little bit of extra time on that. Um, so this whole, yes, question here. I'll think about it. <laughs> um, the question was, can can you get extra credit again for submitting early? I, like I said, I'll think about it. I'll let you know. Um, the whole spring break is like I, I didn't like I don't want to give you guys stuff that's due over break. But I figured, you know, this was originally supposed to be due before break, an extension probably isn't <laughs> unappreciated. Um, the whole like spring break counts as one late day still applies, but now, you know, that starts being applied on Monday instead of this Saturday. Okay, um, other questions on this? How much coffee did it take? Let's not talk about that either. <laughs> um, homework two, problem three, I've gotten like a lot of requests about, uh, about this. I will get back to you after I have a bit of time to think about how to grade this most fairly. Fundamentally, the, the issue is that um, Well, I'll also I'll just pull up the, the homework too right now um, and look at the we can look at the solution. Um, just to just so that we're all on the same page as to, as to what I was looking for. Okay, so I added this after I graded everything and noticed that, you know, a lot of people did use this assumption. So ignore that, that wasn't on the assignment that I gave you. Um, so basically what this question was supposed to do, and this is how I read it when I took the class, you know, a couple of years ago and, uh, um, and how many of you read it is that this is a capacity miss question. So you're supposed to induce a capacity miss in your program, and then in such a in such a way that uh, if you double the cache size, the capacity miss goes away. The easiest way to do this is just to load up the entire cache with stuff. Um, you, you can do the calculations. It takes. Um, 1,024 sequential cache lines, which equates to 4096 integers. Um, and then uh, you then load in another sequential um, one of uh, 1,024 sequential cache lines, and uh, that 
kicks out all of the stuff in your cache. It doesn't even matter if you have what the associativity is at, at, at some point. Like it just will kick everything out um, because of capacity misses. And then you kind of just do that over and over. You go back and load in the first half of your data and come back around. So that's what I, this is kind of what I was looking for, something along these lines where you have a huge array that's twice the size of your cache. You load in the first half of your array. Then you kick it out with another for loop down here. Um, and then you go back and forth between these two um, parts of your uh, array. Uh, another thing to to note is you if, if you do this, you do have to make sure that you increment by four so you never get any spatial locality um, with with the uh, cache line itself. So you are always accessing a new cache line. You're, you're getting um, a, a miss every single time. Um, so, Anyway, that was what I was looking for. I just wanted to make it clear as to as to what what I was going after. Um, and like I said, I will think about how to best uh, grade that question, which probably involves three points, probably. So um, that's that. Any questions? Other than that, uh, we have not covered everything for worksheet nine. That's what we're going to do right now. OK, so it's been like forever since we actually had a lecture because of snow and exams and stuff like that. So um, I'll, I'll go back a couple of slides and, and just do a little bit of review of where we're at. Okay, so first thing um, we, we were talking about um, this two level global branch prediction concept. Um, and there was a a, a, an exam question about this. Um, so hopefully you, you kind of are slightly familiar with it uh, still. So the idea is we have our global history register, which keeps track of the um, direction of our last n branches, where n is however many bits we want to have in our branch predictor. And then we have a table over here, which is our pattern history table, which uh, tells us uh, the direction the branch took the last uh, kind of like it, it takes into account the last however many times uh, we've seen this pattern in our global history register. Um, so it could be in any one of these four states, not just you know one or two. Um, and we'll use that to make a prediction the next time that we see this uh, result in our global history register and we have a branch, we're going to look, oh, let's just assume you know if it's in this state, will predict that this is taken, okay? So there's two levels to this predictor, okay? Now, uh, we did this example last time. So a, a question is, you know, how, how much is this gonna take up? Um, so if we have, say, three-bit counters instead of two-bit counters, and we have 12 bits that we're XORing. So we have 12 bits uh, um, uh, from the branch program counter. Uh, so like the instruction address of our branch and 12 bits of global history. How much is that going to take? And uh, since the index is 12 bit, bits wide, we would need two to the 12 counters. Each counter is three bits. So we'd, we'd need quite a bit for this, uh, this table. 
Um, so 1.5 uh, uh, Kibby bytes. Um, this is Kibby bits. So this is, you know, it, it get, can get large pretty quickly depending on how big your uh, your number, like this is this is the real determining factor, the number of bits that you have in your global history. Now, um, these exist. Um, so the Pentium has a, a four bit global history register. So much less than this other one that has 12. So it's not very hard to store four bits. That's only 16 uh, entries. And then it's uh, multiple different pattern history tables of two bit counters. Um, and we actually have this kind of additional thing where we select which history table to use by some lower order bits in our branch address. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's the Intel Pentium Pro branch predictor. Just a little tidbit on the side. Um, and whenever we're combining our our history register and our branch address. Normally, we're going to use an XOR here. Um, we're adding additional context, and we're going to call this type of predictor a G share predictor. No idea why, but that's what it's called. So, as you can see, uh, you know, you would take your global branch history. And then you would take your branch address, XOR them together, and use that to index into your pattern history table. This will increase your utilization of the pattern history table. It basically just makes your hash function better. Um, and you have some more context information. So your, your pattern history um, can be a bit smarter. Obviously, this is an extra step. So there's going to be more latency. But, you know. It's all trade-offs. Everything in computer architecture, well, not everything, but most things in computer architecture are trade-offs. Okay, so I think that's where we ended. Um, and what, what I'll do now is a bit of review of where we've been, and then we'll dive into the last topic. So we started out one level branch predictor where we, we use our program counter. We look up the address in the, our um, branch target buffer, see if we have a hit or not. This tells us if it's a, uh, if it's a branch instruction. Um, and it tells us where to go if it is a branch instruction, where we think it will go at least. Um, then we have our direction predictor which we index into using our some, some part of our program counter. Um, and that tells us whether or not this will be taken or not. So if it is taken, then we will use this um, branch target buffer to tell us which address to go to. If it's not taken, then we'll just do PC plus four. And that tells us our next fetch instruction, okay? So this is our one level branch predictor. Now, when we have our two level, what we do is we use our program counter to tell us where the branch will go. This tells us our target address. And then we use our global branch history um, which includes where earlier branches went. And we put that into our direction predictor, and that tells us which direction we want to guess um, for our branch prediction. And that's how we determine our next fetch address. And then, as we just saw, this G share uh, branch predictor. We're going to use a program counter again. Same thing. This we always use the program counter to go to our branch target buffer. 
but um, how we index into the branch direction predictor is, is different between all these different ones. Um, in this case, we're using our branch history as well as our program counter, XORing them together and using that to index into our branch predict, uh, branch direction predictor, um, and then determine which way we want to go. And that's how we determine our fetch address. Okay, questions before we move on. Oh, whoops, didn't mean to do that. <laughs> So can we do better? So we have our, you know, our, our original uh, last time and, and, and two bit counters uh, that exploit the, the last time predictability of a given branch. So that's the, you know, just the, the basic, most basic one level stuff. But then, uh, we had a realization, which uh, is that the branch outcome can be correlated with other branch outcomes. So if one if statement is going to be true, then maybe the subsequent one is always going to be false or something like that, or taken and not taken. Right? Uh, and this leads to us developing this global branch prediction idea, where the uh, the direction that previous branches went determines where we think this next branch will go. But there's another realization, which is that a branch's outcome can be correlated with past outcomes of the same branch, in addition to the outcome of the branch the last time it was executed. Um, so this leads us to this local branch prediction idea, which is basically going to be we're going to keep a history at each branch location. And then we're going to use that. Um, and that'll be our local branch prediction. So let's look at the, this code here. Um, if we have our loop test done at the end of the body, the corresponding branch is going to execute with this taken, 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 not taken pattern. Um, so the, the, the first um, it starts at one, so sorry. So it's going to be i equals two, i equals three, and i, I equals four will all be taken, which will take a step back to the front of the loop, the beginning of our loop. And then i equals five will um, cause the n, uh, the not taken, it'll just exit out of this loop. And if we run this loop n times, Um, we are not going to know, obviously, how it behaves the first time around. However, on subsequent loop runs, so you know, if we're if we have another for loop outside of this, uh, if we know the direction this branch has gone in the previous three executions, we're always going to be able to predict where it's going to go uh, for every single subsequent call to this this loop here, this whole loop. Um, whenever, for example, we see TTT, we're going to be like, oh, the next one's going to be not taken. If we see um, that it was taken, taken, not taken as the last three, then we would, we would know that it should be taken. Questions? Yeah. For a for loop, is there a way to know how many takens and not takens there would be? Um, well, so you the the it, for the the condition check at the end of the loop, there would be n minus like n minus one right. so I, I t. 
exactly what we have to do. Based on the, because you already know the before you enter the loop. Oh, because of the condition. I okay. So the question was, can't you kind of just always know, like, exactly how to predict correctly on a for loop? Yeah. Uh, the, the the problem with that is that, what if your for loop is like ten thousand iterations? Sure. Yeah, you can keep track of i is going to go up to ten thousand, but you know you don't want to keep that history. Um, that's going to be your limiting factor, how much look back window you have. And that's limited by, you know, as we, as we saw, like just the, the size of these things as you get higher and higher number of bits in your uh, history register. Um, also, it's, it's kind of like undefined how exactly, like, yeah, these are really simple examples where we're just doing increment by one at each time but if like this was a i plus equals two or something like that then that becomes a little bit more complicated and really hard to do in hardware like there's no way to really infer that that's always going to be the case and even in the body you could have like i plus plus just randomly um so that's gonna screw up your branch prediction but great question. Yeah, like as humans, obviously, we're able to do that. Like we can know exactly where it's going to go. But unfortunately, hardware is stupid. So um, let's look and see how we can capture this. The idea is that we need to have per branch history registers. So instead of just one single global history register, we're going to have multiple different history registers um, for each of our different branches. And what this will allow us to do, where's the TTTN pattern held so we know what happens next time around. So that's what it gets stored. That, that, uh, that, that pattern is how we index into the pattern history table. And then the pattern history table has those two bit counters, which tell us which direction to go. That answer your question? Okay. So yeah, we're we're gonna use this this per branch taken not taken uh, history, and um, this is going to allow us to do stuff like what we saw up here, where we are able to base our prediction on this single one single branch so you know we don't have to worry about any for loops on top of here we don't have to worry about some if statement down below all that we're dealing with is everything is is keeping the history of this specific branch as you might guess this is called a local history branch predictor and this is going to require two different levels of um, history we're going to have our per branch history register. So like our global history register, except for now we have to have per branch. And then that requires a table of different history registers. And then we have the history at that history register value. OK. Let's look at what this, uh, oh, is this the wrong picture? It might be the wrong picture. Oh, well, the next, the next slide has a good picture. So uh, the first level is our set of local history registers. Each of these are n bits, just like our global history register. If we multiply this by like however many you want in your table. And we're going to use our program counter to determine which one of these to use. Um, the second level is again these counters um, we're going to have the same idea of our pattern history table except for uh, this is for our local uh, local branches so here's a picture of what this looks like we use our program counter and 
you'll notice that there's an extra step now between uh, the program counter and it's determining where to go with our direction. So we have to go to this additional new table, which we index into using some subset of the bits in our program counter. We go over here, we figure out which global history uh, or local history register to use, and then we use that to index into our direction predictor. Again, obviously, the same thing happens down here with the target address. We always use the branch target buffer. Okay. Um, not sure what happened in that part of the slide, but it says which directions earlier instances of this branch went. So that's what it's, it's giving us. Any questions before we dive into the last worksheet problem? Cool. So, um, this is worksheet problem B, the oh, 3B. So, this is the last part of the worksheet um, where we're trying to figure out what is the branch prediction accuracy if we have a five bit local branch predictor with, uh, like I said, five bits. Okay. Oh, and we have two bit counters in our pattern history table. I will try and find. Did we do A? Yeah, I think so. We, we definitely started A. Um, I don't think we got to answer in terms of percentage of accuracy, though. OK. Um, We'll, we'll talk about that after then. Okay. So is this, I mean, conceptually, this is almost like now we have, I mean, there's three branches. So we have three sort of separate tables. Like each mm -hmm. branch consults its own sort of like local table. Yep, each branch now is consulting its own local table. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, now, now they kind of have their own independent history. When, um, when this inner uh, the second of the day was right, which was say like on its uh, whatever, very steady state, is the, um, the the global pattern what it starts its loop with? Does that make sense? Um, so like it'll have just come off of the highway, which is going to have like the you know uh, one 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 zero pattern. Is that the first thing they do when they equal to zero or when they get bumped up to one? Or does it like have a, a memory of like what it saw in the last one? Does that make sense? Um, no, so it, it, it'll have the, the, so on when we get back to this for loop, and we have to do our first check. What will be in our history register for this conditional is uh, a bunch of takens and then a not taken when we last exited this loop. Okay, from the J table, not from the high table. Right, so we don't, 
we don't have to worry about what was in this table or in this table at all. So it's only talking about this, this loop here. Tim, anybody have uh, a number? Yeah. 12 out of 13, that sounds pretty, pretty accurate. Okay, so, so why, how, is, how did this work? Well, by the way, in case you were wondering, part A, the answer is 11 out of 13. Um, so let's look at and see why, why uh, this, oh dear. Let's look and see why uh, this one's 11 out of 13, and then that'll inform why we get 12 out of 13 in this next one. Okay, screw it. Uh, we'll just use this. And I'm just gonna actually pull up the solution because that's just really easier. Okay. So this is what we end up with, with uh, global branch prediction. And one of the issues that we have is that we kind of, you know, we kind of blow out this one, 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 one predictor with our second loop. It's just so long that because we don't have enough history when we have five bits, we're always going to like turn it into, you know, some, like it, it's gonna, it's going to start mispredicting um, pretty, pretty rapidly. Like it's going to be not taken, um, and then, or it's going to be predicting taken, and then we have one not taken, which will only give us, you know, just to the to the, to the um, uh, probably not taken state. And uh, then, then we're going to mispredict on eleven because we will have seen two not takens on one 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 or that, that was a little bit too many ones five ones. So it'll be in regardless of where it started, it's going to be in the state that says predict not taken weekly or strongly, probably weekly. Um, actually, definitely weekly, because we had enough taken that this is going to give us strongly, uh, strongly taken. So we're going to miss on 11 because uh, we saw a not taken. And uh, so we're going to predict not taken here, but it was taken. So that's a problem. We're also going to miss here because this single not taken isn't enough to get us out of this cycle of like um, uh, um, like predicting wrong. Okay. Uh, let me one two so yeah this one i think gets this one will always be mispredicted and then this one should does this one get mispredicted as well with a two bit um uh, I have a question. Yeah, question here. Uh, so last time when we uh, talk about this, I think we said that I should start from one and J should also oh, start yeah. from one. So um, I forgot about that. Yeah, great point. So the issue is I, I messed up my indices. Um, and this one actually doesn't ever hit one, 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 one because we don't check at i equals zero, so sorry about that. I forgot about that. Great, great point. 
So why did it begin at one? Well, it, it all goes back to this assembly. We're able to optimize away the first check um, because it's a constant condition that's always going to be true. So we don't have a branch at the beginning. Um, basically, the idea is for loops are compiled as do while loops with an extra if statement on top to determine whether or not we should enter the loop the first time. That doesn't, you know, that doesn't matter for this because it's a constant condition. We're able to just always go straight into the loop. We don't have to have a branch guarding that. Um, okay, where, where were we? Okay, yeah, so sorry. This one and this one miss. Now uh, we can get rid of one of those um, because we, we no longer mispredict on five. Um, because we, we didn't never, oh wait, damn it. We never mispredict. Let me check something. So how do we get that? Okay, let me, let me, um, here's what we'll do. I actually, I, I have, I'm gonna go recalculate all these because I, I, I think that I, I might have screwed this one up. The problem is I don't have the actual solution. I just have like the final result. I will check again and I'll, just write something on the worksheet and I'll give you credit uh, for it. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to you after spring break, I guess. I'll, I'll probably actually email you as well. Uh, again, like basically the idea is what I was trying to do with this uh, is, is say, oh, well, you're gonna end up inducing one less myth because you're no longer missing on your predictions for this first for loop. You're only missing on predictions for, oh shoot, for this second for loop. But I might've screwed up the actual bits um, just slightly. So I will correct that and get back to you. So apologies. Um, Okay, uh, yeah, I, I will, I'll, I'll figure out exactly um, what's the, the, the answer is here. But I, I wanna talk about a few additional considerations and then, then I'll, then I'll um, we can talk about the project and the exam. So, Um, we can use different types of predictors. So, so, you know, sometimes it seems like this local branch predictor is good. Sometimes the global one is good. Sometimes, you know, other predictors are, are good. Um, we could, for example, 
integrate our two-bit counters and our global predictor. And this could give us better accuracy. Different predictors are better for different branches. We'll have a reduced warm-up time, so we can use our faster warm-up predictors. Um, these would be, you know, your just normal two-bit counters, for example. Um, a slower one would be the global predictor. Uh, that one takes a little while to warm up. It takes a little while to get to a steady state. The cons, though, is we need another bit of logic to select which branch predictor to use. So we need a selector or a meta predictor, something like this. Obviously, more hardware, more latency, more cost, all of the above. OK. An example of this is the this computer here, the Alpha 21264 pro microprocessor, which has um, kind of a pretty bad branch penalty at minimum, but um, but it's okay. Um, typical branch penalty is 11 plus cycles though, so that's not so hot. And what it does is um, it uses both a, a local history table with a local prediction and a global one. Um, and then it, it uses that to determine our final prediction. Um, and we have, instead of, it uses, a, it uses the instruction cache basically to, uh, to, to store our branch targets. Now, one annoying thing is that we have to reset, at least in this microprocessor, reset all of the prediction tables on every context switch. So that's not so great. Because um, you know, if our context switches aren't happening, happening that often, this is OK. But if they are, we're going to have uh, kind of bad times. Could more? then one predictor be run in parallel. Yes, so we can do both of these at the same time. But once we get our prediction, we're going to have to figure out which one to use, which we will do using another choice predictor. So more overhead, right? This is, this is like a lot of steps. So as you can see, obviously, depending on you know, which benchmark you're looking at, depending on you know, which choices you make, you're going to get a wide variety of different prediction accuracies for different workloads. It's very workload dependent, right? If, if you're just doing you know, something that has very, very few if statements, maybe you're just doing a bunch of for loops that are very, very long, where you're going to be just taken, 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 making forever. Even something like a, uh, a a global or like a a just one level branch predictor is just going to be fine. If you're doing something that involves more logic, then obviously you're going to be wanting to do something more complicated, and and you're okay with incurring a bit of extra cost. Okay. Um, Another consideration to make is that there, there can be biased branches. So, so these are branches that are kind of always or pretty darn close to always taken or pretty darn always close uh, uh, not taken. Um, for example, if we have a for loop that is just going for like 10,000 iterations, I mean, sure, maybe we, you know, we could just always predict it's taken and be fine um, because you know, we'd miss once every 10,000 iterations. That's OK. The problem is that these branches, if we're using some other different uh, methodology that, that involves uh, more levels, for example, we're going to pollute our structures, our branch prediction structures, with these branches that are pretty much always taken or always not taken. This 
is going to cause interference uh, with other branches. So, so the idea is that, like, um, you know, we we can't have fundamentally a a branch predictor for every single branch. You know, we're going to eventually need to mod and hash and put them into a, our table, right? It's it's a, it's basically a cache. Um, so we're going to have to map to the same same item. And if we have a branch that's just like super aggressive, always taken, for example, it's going to cause interference with the other branches that are mapping to the same one. It's going to be unfortunate because there's no need for it to really interfere with it. So the solution, obviously, would be, hey, why don't we just detect these things? And we can, if we detect that it's a, um, a biased branch is like always um, uh, not taken or always taken, then we're going to just say, hey, let's just get rid of this. We're going to ignore this one and use a simpler branch prediction whenever we see it. So that's one way of doing this. Um, obviously, the seminal paper on this is this one, which has been cited on every single slide, I'm pretty sure. Okay, now here's another idea. So control flow dependencies suck. They're really terrible. Let's see, is there a way to mm, convert these control dependencies into data dependencies and eliminate our branch? So the idea is that we have on each instruction, we're gonna have a predicate bit um, which is based on a predicate comp uh, computation. And then only instructions with true predicates are committed. Everything else turns to a no op. What does this look like? Okay. So say we have our, our code here. Or have a condition. And if it's true, we do this. If it's false, we do this. And then we, we do something on the outside. Uh, so A is going to represent the conditional, you know, um, B is going to represent this one, or what well, says move B one. Yeah, so this is the 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 uh, the condition is false, and then uh, this one here is going to be C. Okay. So if we if we just compile this like normal, we're gonna have a branch which will jump uh, to down here if it's if it's taken if it's true, or it'll just go into this else if it's false and then it'll jump to the end. So we have these 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 two different ways of of going through this flow. But as you notice, there's a branch here. That's not cool. We don't like branches. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to convert this to predicated code, where now we're going to do A and then both B and C, except we have this additional thing here, which is a, a predicate. If and only if this is true, will the rest of the, the instruction be actually committed. Otherwise, we're just going to skip it, and it'll just do nothing. So if our condition is, is true, we're going to go ahead and, you know, this one's obviously going to be false. So we're going to be uh, able to just not commit it. And then we'll go ahead and commit C because the predicate is true. And then you'll notice, hey, no branches. No branches, no need for branch prediction. Let's look at an example of this. Uh, so we go ahead and fetch A and B and C, and then we continue on with, with D. And if you remember back like two weeks ago, we had a very similar picture to this, um, except for this time we, we didn't fetch both sides of our branch. We only fetched one. And when we got to the end, we had to flush the pipeline. Well, now, as we keep going, all that we have to do is 
turn one of these into a no op again if the predicate's false, which is way better than having to flush this pipeline. So that's cool. Yes, question. So are these just like a construction or a uh, so these are representing instructions in this case. Well, so if we have multiple instructions on our branch, then we could have a predicate in front of each one of those different uh, instructions. It, so, you know, we, we could, oh, good grief. Uh, we could have like move P1 with this not P1 predicate, and then also another instruction with a not P1 predicate. Yeah. Yeah, but of course, this is pretty, you know, this can get pretty expensive the more and more instructions you have on each branch, right? You know, this is pretty simple. There's only the worst that's going to happen is you're going to know up one of but if you have like 20 instructions on each side, then you might as well just flush the pipeline at that point. Um, how would nested branches work? Nested branches with predicates? Ooh. I don't know. That doesn't sound very uh, easy, at least. Well, let me let me think about that. Um, let me take note. Twenty-four. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'm not, I'm really not sure. Like, honestly, the, the thing with predicated execution is it's not really suited for anything too complicated. So uh, again, this is a comparison to our branch prediction situation where if we, if C was predicted that we take this, this side of the branch and then it was false and you have to do the pipeline flush, now we only have to turn it into a NOF. That's all we have to do. Okay, so what are some pros? Um, obviously, this eliminates mispredictions for our hard to predict branches, but um, it can cause useless work for our branches uh, that are easy to predict. You know, if this is like always taken, for example, and then we have to, you know, always use up this extra one that that uh, does our no ops, that's going to use more uh, resources and cause useless work. Obviously, again, as with every single one of these optimizations, more hardware is required. And in this case, we also need ISA support. So we need some way of indicating to the processor via our instruction set architecture that we have a predicated instruction. And we're not ever gonna eliminate all of our hard to predict branches. Um, this exists in the wild. Most ARM instructions are like this. They can have an optional condition in the code. Um, and yeah, it, if the predicate matches, if the condition matches, then we will go ahead and execute the instruction. Otherwise, it'll just, uh, it'll just skip it. Okay, last topic here. Wouldn't it be nice if we could um, use predicated execution when we would actually mispredict? And when we would predict correctly, we just um, use, use our normal branch prediction logic. 
enter these things called wish branches. So the idea is the compiler is going to generate code that can be executed either as predicated or non-predicated code. And then the hardware is going to decide which one to use at runtime. The primary way of determining which one of these to use is what is your confidence with the branch prediction? So if your confidence is low, then you go predicated route. Uh, if your confidence is high, then you just go branch prediction route. Uh, and this gives you kind of this idea of, you know, our, our easy to predict branches at runtime, they're going to use the branch code. And then hard to predict ones, they're going to use the predicated code. Here's an example of how this works. So again, we're back to our A, B, C, D example. And we have two different ways that we can execute. We can either do this, you know, with the with the branches or with the predicated code. But now we're going to use a different uh, new instruction set effectively with these wishes wish jumps. And this will allow the hardware to determine which one to use. Uh, and, and you can see we still have our predicates. So we kind of combine both of these together where we still have our predicates on the instructions in case that we go with the predicated execution. And then we also have the jumps. We have these uh, uh, wish jumps, which to tell us where to go if we decide to use the uh, non-predicated branch predicted method instead. So now we have both options. Um, if we decide to use normal branch code, we're just going to, you know, it's a high confidence prediction. We'll just go ahead and use our wish jump and actually just do our, uh, our jump and continue executing C and D. Um, and if it is uh, not taken, then we're just gonna, going to uh, uh, execute just continue executing here and then at our wish join then we're going to jump all the way down to to d this is just exactly like normal branching code except for now we just have this extra little a little additional thing of well these instructions originally you know they they, they could be predicated but we decided to choose this uh branching version and as you could tell we only execute three instructions in either case. So that's cool. But what if it's hard to predict? We have low confidence in our prediction. Now uh, we're going to just kind of skip our, our, uh, our, our, our jumps. They're just going to be here. But we instead just oh, use our predicated execution. And we're going to turn one of these into a no op, depending on which one uh, happens to be uh, the false case. Okay, any, any questions? Oh, sorry, Ethan, I did not see your question earlier. Uh, yes, that is done. So, yeah, the problem is that there's so many things that are dependent on compiler optimization. Like I said, I'll, I'll go through the math again and figure it out. Okay, so last, last bit here. If we have our um, this is this is our if this is our code and it's hard to predict um, we're going to end up basically executing two different paths uh, in, in parallel and see which one is the correct one once we once we actually resolve a this is our this is our dual path execution concept okay Um, that is it for, for
branch prediction. Um, as far as things that you might, you know, want to know about for some exam that you might have to take at the end of the semester, I would say probably not going to see a wish jump. Just saying. But um, you will probably see something about branch prediction. Any last questions before I go ahead and we'll, we'll hop into talking about the exam and um, projects. Okay, let me figure out how to how to do this. Okay. Grades are published. Um A couple things to that I want to mention. So that curve problem was kind of really bad. So I gave everyone full credit on it because it was just impossible to grade correctly. And also, it wasn't as simple as I thought. It it gets really complicated. Um, so uh, that one, everyone got full credit on, and everyone was able to remember the three types of cash messages as well. So good job. I'm probably going to go back on 11 and regrade some of them as well. So please don't send me any regrade requests for a day or two on that one. Um, and then Uh, anything else that I wanted to mention? Oh, uh, so for for this for question ten. Uh, one of the, one of the keys was, um, uh, to, you, you can't reschedule, like you can't swap your branches or else you break control flow. Okay. So just that, that was a big, uh, common, uh, mistake to, that I saw. So just, uh, be aware of that. And also, um, you can't have your branch inside of another branch's branch delay slot. That's why we're, you know, we had to add in this stall, extra stall here in this example. Okay. Um, Yes, in question. Your rubric template, how is that optimized for specificity when you're adding in you're adding in a structure for an extra key like we're not Sure. Whereas before we already run the Branch not with two delay slots, and then the last branch. So the so the question was basically like this doesn't look very very optimal. There's like two more instructions. Well, the problem is that you know when we had our 
original code, there were no branch delay slots. We decided that adding branch delay slots would help things. But honestly, they kind of didn't. <laughs> this is the most optimal that you can get uh, with branch delay slots. Um, and so in this case, well, your, your non-branch delay slot architecture would be better. Uh, one, of the, one of the keys is, is looking at all the data dependencies. So T4 has to, it depends on instruction three, which depends on both T2 and T9, which are one and two. If you didn't have one of these data dependencies, you could move it down into your branch delay slot and you could help uh, reduce the number of iterations. Now, one thing that we are able to do is move these instructions five and six down below this branch, which at least prevents us from, you know, having two more no ops. If we had, uh, you know, our, our no ops in here, like two no ops after this branch as well, then that's going to be, you know, quite, uh, quite suboptimal even worse than what we already have with these 10 instructions. Um, as far as the project, I wanna highlight a couple of things. First of all, I recommend you read the prefetchers.h file because it kind of explains something pretty key that the function should call the cache system mem access function to prefetch lines. So there's no need for you to implement anything crazy in here. All you have to do is say, hey, we already implemented the whole mem access part. Just use that except for make sure to set is prefetch to true. So you don't get an infinite prefetch loop. So, there, so you can add, like it doesn't sound like they failed prefetch loop, meaning like you tried to prefetch something that was already in the cache. It's fine. Like it right, so in this case, yeah, you can, you can do stuff like prefetch a line that's already in the cache and hey, it's a hit, great, nothing happens. And that's what all those starting blocks are, just that like if it is prefetch, don't modify that cache. Right? Yeah. The solutions are not going to be posted. Um, the questions that were asked were so the, the the question the first question was like, hey, this doesn't look very optimal. Why is this the the solution? Um, and why do five and eight have to be moved? So five. What do you mean five and? Eight. Eight isn't really moved, it's just displaced by these two instructions. So, so okay, this is another thing. You can't have, so in our original code without our branch delay slots, this, uh, this add, this add of T12, T13, T14 is only executed if the branch is not taken. If it's taken, then we wouldn't execute this. So if you put it in your branch delay slot, if you put it in as like in the this first or second instruction after a branch, it's always going to be executed, which is problematic because uh, that's not the original control flow. Okay, um, I, I'm guessing people are going to have more questions that are better suited for offline, but I wanted to touch on a few uh, a few things that that were most often missed. So that's 
that's it for me. I'll, I'll stick around for any further questions, but uh, you guys are free to to uh, head out and enjoy spring break. Yes, Alex. I just had a quick question about uh, question eight with the right after right dependency, because I totally get why lines three and four are a um, read after write, but I was just kind of confused how it's a like the rubric explanation makes sense. I was just kind of having trouble correlating it to the right after right example from the slides, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, so the question was uh, about 8.2. So the, the key is that our destination register for both of these instructions is the same. So we're, we're writing to R5 on this one. And then we're also writing to R5 on this one. Okay, yeah, because I just thought the the right after right um, data dependency like had to have a read in between um, kind of thing. Well, but I guess not, that was just like that think was about, wrong. Yeah, think about a consideration. Think about a situation where you have this going the, these two operations happening in parallel in a in a um, uh, a processor that you know has two parallel data paths. You know this could be. This is an add. This is a multiply. The multiply likely may take longer. So if you commit this first, then that's going to be wrong. So you have a dependency here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That makes sense. Yep. I have a question about the project. Like when you, if you just decrease the total number of speech questions, does that an improvement? Even if I. I know if you have too many prefetches, you can get like conflict misses. Sure. But isn't a prefetch also like an access passing with like higher latency? So, like if you. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So, if you reduce the number of prefetches while still maintaining. Yeah, like, like in my example, like I had one where I like have 36 more misses, but I went from like. 12,000 prefetches, like 900 prefetches. Oh, see so like, that? That would be like overall. Three yeah, so I mean, great question. Like the metrics that I'm going to, I haven't figured out exactly how I'm going to, you know, rank them, but yeah. metrics that I will look at is how many prefetches you're doing. Is it like 10,000 and you're getting like very marginal increase? Or, you know, like in your case where you're reducing the number of total prefetches, that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely going to take that into consideration as I calculate, like, um, how, how it compares to other solutions. Um, and yeah, obviously since you're only getting a, a very small miss rate increase, it's not, you know, yeah. with that extra reduction of, of prefetching, that's pretty good. I just want to make sure I feel like it's still an access to memory for reducing that total number by like a large amount over or like right yeah amount. so you're optimizing for bandwidth effectively and so that's something that you could just mention in your documentation like hey this prefetcher mm -hmm. you know it isn't necessarily optimizing for for hits right. it's trying to stabilize hits and not make them any worse but i'm optimizing for uh, for memory bandwidth okay. um so that would be the the way that i would go about and then talking about like, it. Does a prefetch like take up like a cycle basically? So I was seeing stuff about like stream buffers where like they won't put it in right away, but well, I don't know. We're we're happens. just pretending that prefetch prefetching is magical and doesn't okay. incur any yeah any okay. overhead okay. as far as that goes. Okay. If you do want to like there is one benefit of a stream buffer, which is that you avoid can avoid a bunch of um thrash in your cache. Um, and if you want to implement a stream buffer, that's fine. I mean, isn't a stream buffer kind of just like we have a test carry cast for like pre cast pre basically? Yeah. Um, but like I said, well, well, the thing that it will do is it'll, you know, if you prefetch the wrong thing, it won't like 
cause conflict yeah. misses. So you might, with the stream buffer, be, be able to reduce your conflict misses. So you know that that's something that you can do. Like the starter code is totally not designed to have that implemented, yeah, like straight up. <laughs> and then like for the part where it's like show that this is like implementable the hardware, like if I hang on to like recent read memory or recent memory accesses and then like scores for an offset or something like that, so I'd say like this would just basically be like two buffers. Uh, yeah, I mean yeah, and maybe also talk about how much space they would require. Because, like, if it's like it'll be like ten gigabytes of space, okay, that's just like not, no. I mean, this is yeah. But if it's like ten cache lines, it's like whatever. Yeah, that that would be totally fine to store that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great question. Somebody asked a question. Trying to find it. Is it about? Uh, about adding, like if you have a hit time and a miss time, your response would just add them together. Like you incur, you know, the hit, the, the one cycle to determine it was a miss. And then Correct. Add, but then on, I stated that assumption on that problem, I think you're looking at right there, and that was not the response they got. So I guess my question is, did I, you actually say that? Or not? I uh, no, I did not. I did. Uh, so, so. If I I might have mistaken something with the grading of that, basically like you do have to for the cash miss penalty. Anytime you see a penalty, it's in addition to whatever you had to incur if it was correct. That was my understanding. I, I wrote that sort of like as an assumption. It's one plus twenty five. Yeah, I, I might have just missed it, and or your calculation might have just been off, or I might have just totally you know. I looked at you know 70, 660 of these. Yeah, so now that I'm reading this, it says branch missed prediction penalty is in addition to the time for a correct prediction. So I actually don't know if that's like even two points for that or this is what should have been. That's what that is that it should have been that. Yeah, sorry, sorry. So so a lot of these deductions are are saying you got minus points because this thing is true, but you didn't take that into account. So that's how to read those. Well, just like just the way that uh, yeah, just uh, just do a regrade request. So Justin had a question: Does sub T one T two T three go into T one or T three? It goes into T one. Yeah. So on this on this one, like we're we're going this direction. Okay. Any other questions on Zoom? I, I, I'm going to actually email something right now. I'll have off star tonight. Thank you, uh, Sunder. I have maybe one more quick question for you. Okay. Um, okay. So on question number five, uh, I was I was just uh, I was wondering here is the only correct answer right buffer or was any other kind of answer considered? I didn't consider any other answers. This is one where I'm considering going back and regrading it. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I guess I was just kind of wondering. So one thing that isn't a correct answer is just turning it into a right, right through cache because that doesn't help anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had personally mentioned using uh, the concept of like the inclusive cache where L2 contains the data items of L1 as well. Um, that 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 also doesn't really help because okay. you, you still have, you, you still incur two cycles penalty every single time you have to do any write. You know, even if it's, especially, and, and the key is that um, what happens if you modify something in L1? You have to propagate that right into L2. I see what you're saying. So, so are you saying that the right buffers are are 
kind of like asynchronous structures, so to speak. I, I think I kind of yeah. misunderstand that. Yeah, okay. So um, this is in in the in this slide deck um, down towards the bottom somewhere. Um, I think. Oh no, it was in the. I think it was in the. Uh, it was in one of these. Oh six. Yeah, it's this guy here. Mm. So you so you you put your evicted lines in the buffer so that it, they can take you know that's going to be fast, but then committing it into L two is going to be a little bit slower. So, so you're able to to absorb that cost using this buffer. I see. So so the when it says unified, so it would have to be basically this this inclusive idea, but it would also need a right buffer. It would also need a right buffer. Okay, yeah. so I need it would need both parts, so to speak. Yeah, and you could like you know if you had. Yeah, I mean, just fundamentally, the the question was meant to to kind of just get you thinking about the fact that this arrow, you know, if 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 you get rid of the right buffer, this arrow takes two cycles. Mm -hmm. How do we fix that? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and so, yeah. Okay, I think that that kind of so, answers that question. So pipelining the rights doesn't help with this case. That just helps with making sure that you don't have to do both. Um, uh, where, where's the, both the tag check and the write in two separate cycles. So this is in a, a single cache. How long does it take to do a write to that cache rather than how long it takes to write to L2? Yeah. 